Okay, let's get started. So hello everyone, my name's Catherine Stanley, or Kate, um, and I'm going to be giving today an introduction to Apache Kafka. Uh, I'm a software engineer, I work at IBM on a product called IBM Event Streams, which I'll just introduce very shortly at the end. But first I want to get a bit of an idea of what audience we have here. So who has already heard of Apache Kafka a little bit? Pretty much everything in the room, okay. Um, who's actually run Apache Kafka themselves? Okay. Um, who already feels like they know sort of how it works? Okay, so that's why you're here. Good to know. So what I'm going to do is sort of set the scene initially for why Apache Kafka is so popular, what it does, and then I'll talk through some of the basic concepts that you need to know getting started with Kafka. And then at the end, if I have time, I'll show you your first running Kafka locally on your laptop. So a bit of context. Companies are transforming to be more customer-centric or risk-losing risk losing customers to those that are. So if you think back to the last time you downloaded a new app or you picked a new service, did you pick the one that had all of the features listed under the sun, or did you actually pick the one that you felt would work best for you? And particularly, did you pick the one where you could see that other people were saying that it worked for them and you can relate to those people? So companies are really having to think about context and not just providing something that has function, but that really works for the particular customers. Customers want to feel like that product, that application, whatever it is, is really built for them. In fact, eight out of 10 millennials say that they would switch accounts to get better rewards. So people are definitely keen to switch. So this, making this change is really important. And the way that a lot of companies are doing this is by moving to being event-driven. So I'm going to show an example here. I feel like I should stop giving this example because it's about delayed flights. And every time I do it, my flight gets delayed or cancelled. Um, so my flight was cancelled <laughs> on the way here. Luckily, I am here, so I did manage to get another flight. But imagine the scenario when your flight is delayed. So we've got Zoom Air as this imaginary commercial airline. And they're wanting to re-accommodate passengers before they even realize that their journey has been disrupted. So I've got a little demo to kind of walk you through an example here. If I can get it to play. Is that started? Oh. Won't play. Is that playing? There we go. OK. So imagine I've picked my flight and I'm going to go to Tampa Bay. So I've all booked my flight, that's fine. And then let's say we've got something happened and my flight's been cancelled. Well, what if I could get a notification straight into my phone that tells me your flight's been delayed? I can look up other options. I can see exactly what's going on here to say, OK, yeah, my flight's delayed. I can see how that's going to affect my whole journey. I can then click through to say, what other options do I want? Book a new flight, and then we're all good. So this is a typical scenario for something being event-driven. Rather than having my events happening in the background and the airline knowing what the planes are doing, but my customers don't really know, I'm getting information straight away. And you can see scenarios where if we've got rain, then that could affect my taxi, so different changes could come in to my taxi company versus the airline, and all the different types of delays that you might see. But the key piece here is that it's connecting different parts of a whole system. So from a customer point of view, I don't look at it as my airline, my taxi, whatever it is. I look at it as my trip from place A to place B. By using event-driven, I can have my events going on, which in this case is what's happening with the weather, what's happening with my flights. I can connect that to the customer and explain to them, this is what's happening, this is how we can help you, not just for your flight, but perhaps for your taxi, for other onward travel. For me, this would have been really useful when my flight got cancelled for this event, because actually I logged onto the website for my airline, and I tried to rebook my flight, and their apps just weren't working. And 
It turned out later, I think they had rebooked my flight, but they hadn't told me. So if they had a properly working event system, then it probably would have worked better. So we've got this shift towards being event-driven. So being event-driven delivers engaging client experiences. And it's about getting that data to the customers when it's needed, but even before it's needed, if possible. So there's a couple of different things you can do with this. You can respond to events in real time as they happen. So the airline example is a perfect example where I don't want my airline to tell me an hour or two hours after they cancel my flight. I want them to tell me almost before they've even decided, OK, we're going to cancel this flight. They should have known in advance, really, that my flight was going to be cancelled coming here because everyone knew about the strikes, but they didn't tell me until less than 12 hours before I was supposed to get on my flight. It's about delivering responsive customer experiences. So by bringing events into your applications, you can have uh, an experience that is loading things in real time, updating, providing context. And it allows you to bring real-time intelligence to your applications. So machine learning applications generally work on data. And you can use events as your data store and as your data source to actually continue to evolve your machine learning and your intelligent applications in real time. So what does this mean in practice? That's the kind of business why you should move to it. Well, in practice, what we're looking at is having an event backbone. So all of our applications now focus, rather than being data-centric and looking in a database, they're event-centric and looking at this event backbone. So you have some event sources coming in. This could be sensors, clicks on your website. You hopefully would be doing some stream processing, so analyzing those events as they're coming in. I mentioned having an event store, so you can archive those events, look back, reprocess in the future, and then having notifications. So the airline example is a perfect one where you would provide notifications to update people and make them feel like they're really the focus of your application or your business or whatever it is. So this event backbone can be used in a few different ways. I've already talked about an input for machine learning. We, of course, have event-driven microservices, which are hopefully a kind of term you've heard quite a lot. So moving from being REST-based to being event-driven. And the other interesting one is having a bridge to cloud-native apps. So by having this event backbone that's your one core piece that goes through all of your applications, what I've actually seen is people saying, well, I'm going to connect my existing applications through to my new applications that I'm rapidly developing through this event backbone. And we'll see how Kafka enables that a bit later on. So whenever I start talking about Kafka and event streaming, everybody always says, well, isn't that just what we've been doing for ages? And particularly coming from IBM, people ask about IBM MQ, and isn't that just the same? So I always put this slide in just to kind of set uh, my understanding or the way I like to explain what the difference between message queuing and event streaming is, just so that we're all on the same page. So message queuing provides transient data persistence. If you pass a message through a message queuing system, once it's been read off the queue, it's no longer there. You potentially expect it to change as it gets passed through the system. It's uh, basically more suited to the kind of request, reply, targeted, reliable delivery. I'm going to request a specific application to do a specific task, and so I'm going to send you a message to do that. And message queuing is something that has been around for a long time. Event streaming has these kind of aspects, so particularly stream history. So any event streaming, you see the ev any event streaming um, system will have an immutable log of stream history, so you can go back and replay it, and that's something you don't tend to get in a message queuing system. Also provides scalable consumption, so this is something really powerful. We looked at the Zoom Air example. I said you could have your customers being notified from the airline, but they could also be notified if there's heavy rain and maybe they need their car to arrive earlier. 
being able to have many different applications all viewing the same data is really powerful. And that's something that doesn't work quite as well in a message queuing system. It's really something that in event streaming they've focused on. And the final one is the immutable data. A stream of events is a stream of statements of something that has happened. It's not a message saying, I want you to do this. It's this happened, then this happened, then this happened. So it should be immutable. You don't change it after it's happened. So this is the kind of difference between message queuing and event streaming. And so for an event backbone that you've built into your system, these are the kind of properties that you want. So we've got the stream history. We've got immutable data. We want it to be highly available, because if you've got lots of data coming in all of the time, you want to be accessing it in real time, you do need it to be highly available. You want it to be scalable as well for the same reason. And then I already mentioned about having many consumers. So we've got people shifting across to have this event-driven view of the world, focusing on being event-centric with this event backbone. So that's where Apache Kafka comes in. So Apache Kafka is an open source distributed streaming platform. It was originally created by LinkedIn, who then open sourced it. And the Kafka community is very vibrant and growing. I've been involved with going along to some of the conferences that are run by the community and meetups. And there's always so many people there. In fact, I actually spoke at a meetup last night. And despite the fact that we had the strikes, there was still a good number of people who came out to hear about new things in Kafka. So Kafka provides publish subscribe to a stream of events. Because it's uh, event streaming, you store the events in a durable way. And it allows you to process streams of events as they occur. So it fulfills everything that you would really need in your event backbone. But there are other event streaming technologies out there. So why is Apache Kafka so popular? I think the reason it's grown in popularity so quickly is because it's come about at the right time. So there's this business trend of looking to have apps that react to changing events, looking at large volumes of data, large volumes of event streams. And at the same time, we've got these technology trends of wanting to scale horizontally, wanting to have that stream history. And Kafka really fits both of these sections. So it really was just created at the right time because it was written by developers for developers. It's become really popular among the developer community. And basically, lots of people have just picked it up and said, this is what we want to use. So it's definitely a really good technology to get involved with. So this is kind of the various different parts that you might want to know about when it comes to Kafka. And I'm going to delve into each of these during this presentation. So let's start with the Kafka cluster. This is the very core of your event backbone. And generally, a Kafka cluster is made up of one or more brokers. Generally, you will have three. I'll go into a bit more why that is later. But you have these brokers that are kind of the core place where all of these events um, are being sent. And in Kafka, the core grouping of types of events are called topics. So you can think of a topic as just a way of grouping similar types of events. You could have an orders topic. You could have a payment topic, maybe. It's up to you how you structure it, but that's the kind of grouping of types of events. And because this is an immutable data set, we, if we have these as our events that we're adding, we always add on to the end. So we've got a topic with all these new events coming in. So we've got our topic. And, when it gets, and the topic will get stored on the brokers. But it's actually spread across the different brokers. So this is the first sort of key term, apart from topics, that you need to know, and that's partitions. So this is how Kafka provides scalability. If I had one topic, topic A, and I stored the whole topic on broker one, then all of the interaction with that topic would have to go through that particular broker. So for scaling, that's not really that great. Because if my broker gets overwhelmed, I don't have anywhere to go. So in Kafka, the way that you scale is using partitioning. So within a specific topic, you will separate it into different partitions. So you can see here we've got three partitions, and they're separated over the three brokers. So that means if I've got, say, three different applications that are sending events to topic A, 
one of them will be sending it to partition one, one to partition two, and one to partition three. And Kafka does provide some ordering guarantees, and that's done within a partition. So if I have events coming into my partition in a particular order, then Kafka will guarantee they'll get written into the event log in that order. So you can see Kafka already has scaling built into the way it works. But we've got these three brokers, and we want three because of the way that Kafka does availability. So in Kafka, we have one for a particular topic, so topic A. For a particular partition within that topic, we have what's called a leader, and then we have followers. So in this case, broker one is the leader for topic A, partition one and the other two are just followers. So what this means is, by default, when Kafka stands up, it will, under the covers, as soon as you send any new events into the leader, it will replicate them to the other followers. So you don't have to configure that. Kafka will do that for you. And this is true for all of the other topics and partitions as well. So you can see here that we've got topic a with partition two, the leader is now broker two. For three, the leader is broker three, and they're all being replicated. So Kafka will try and spread them out so that we have good scaling. But for availability, we have all of these replicas. And crucially, what this means is if one of my brokers were to go down, so in this case, broker one's gone down, I've lost topic A, partition one, so that means my leader is unavailable, what will happen is something called a leader election. So Kafka will just pick a new leader. So the reason it's called a leader is because basically every single application that is sending events to Kafka and pulling events from Kafka has to talk to the leader for the topic and the partition that they're adding to or pulling from. So for your applications, when the leader went down, it wouldn't have been able to send in more events. But Kafka will quickly elect a new leader you need to make sure you've set up your application so that they do some retry or something. But if they'll quickly switch across, carry on, and you're fine. And you haven't lost any data. So it's set up perfectly to make sure that it is fault tolerant. It assumes that if something goes down, then you'll be fine. And the reason that we normally have three is because within Kafka, there are some configuration options that require you to actually restart the broker in order to take effect. There are a lot that are dynamic, and you don't have to actually do any restarts, but there are some you'll have to restart. So you want to assume that you might have to restart a broker at some point just to apply those changes. And if you then have three of these, then obviously if one goes down because you've restarted it and then another goes, you haven't actually lost any data. You've still got your one replica left standing. So generally, three is your minimum that you want to start at. Some people will then move up to something like five. Um, but in order to do this leader election, you want to aim for an odd number, because the brokers between them um, work in a quorum. So in order to pick the leader, they have to agree who it is. So we've got high scaling, and we've got high availability. And this all comes with the way Kafka works with brokers, topics, and partitions. So next, I'm going to look at producers and consumers. So this is the name we give to applications that send events into Kafka and pull from Kafka. So producers, um, as their name might suggest, produce events into Kafka. And to understand how producers work and how you want to set up your producer applications, we have to look a little bit closer at what an event record looks like in Kafka. So I talked about having topics, and I talked about the fact that you have to append to the topics. But the, top, the um, different events in Kafka actually get given a number as they get added. And a, an event in Kafka is actually a key value pair. So you have a key, and then you have the value, which is your message. So we've got our events being added on. They're always added to the end. And these numbers are known as offsets. So Whenever an event record comes into Kafka, it gets given an offset, and that's the offset that it keeps then forevermore because um, it's an immutable log. But crucially, when you're doing um, producing onto Kafka, the keys are used for the partitions. So if you have the same key, by default, it will put it onto the same partition. And your topics aren't kept forever. Although it's an immutable log, 
and they won't change. People don't have unlimited storage. That's not a thing. So you do, at some point, have to drop some of the message from your event log. And you do that using retention period. And that's, again, we'll see linked in with a key. So you can set your retention time in or your retention period in time or in bytes. So you can say, I want to keep all of the events from the last week, but then after that, you can start getting rid of them. The offsets won't change. They'll stay the same. But just the earlier events will be removed. And as I said, you can set size instead. So if you know how much size you're going to use, and that's the maximum, you can keep going until you fit that size. But there is something else you can do which links in with the keys and the retention period, and that's called compaction. So generally, when you're using Kafka, you'll be using it as an event store where you want all of the events, and you want to be able to replay all of those events. But it might be that actually you want to use it more like a database. So if I did had an event which was an update to an address, maybe I don't need that previous event that was updating that address last time. And you can do that using compaction. So if I have this particular partition, and you can see it's got a, a set of events, of records, and they've got um, 0 to 5 is the offset, and you can see my different keys. So I've got A, B, A, C, C, B, and then I've got some different values. What compaction will do if you turn it on is on a, I think it's on a specific time schedule, but it's up to you how you set it. But when compaction occurs, what Kafka will do is delete all but the last event with a specific key. So the result in this case will mean I get to keep offsets 2, 4, and 5, so that I only have one event with each of the unique keys. So generally, when you get started, you often won't necessarily need to use keys, but it's are very important that you understand what they're for and how they're going to be used in different scenarios, because Kafka does make use of them in different ways. So compaction makes use of keys to allow you to delete old events in a specific way if you want to. But for producers, they use the keys to choose where to produce to. So if by default I provide no key, what will happen is as a producer sending in events, they'll go in a round robin. So I'll start with partition 0, then partition 1, then partition 2, and then the next three events will go around. So I'll get another one on 0, then another on 1, and then another on 2. If I haven't got, um, whether or not I've got compaction turned on, if I set a key for my particular record, what Kafka will do is it will always send it to the same partition. So if I send, even if the message value is different, if I send it with the same key, I'll, if I've got one on partition 0, the next one with the same key will go to the same partition. And the way it does it is by hashing across the different partitions. So this guarantee only occurs if you keep the same number of partitions. So when you're standing up your Kafka for the first time and you're deciding on how am I going to scale, what am I going to do with my partitions, you want to aim to have enough partitions to scale out to your sort of max number if you care about the ordering and the specific locations within the partitions that your different events go, because the ordering guarantees are within partition. So we've got our topics, we've got our keys and values, and perhaps our producers are making some choices. Well, Kafka's making the choice, but they're choosing which keys to use and where they'll go. But your producer is very highly configurable. You'll find this with everything in Kafka. Everything is highly configurable, which is why it's so great, because you can set it up exactly how you want. But it also means you have to understand some of the key pieces before you start playing around. Otherwise, you can quite quickly tie yourself in knots. So the key one for a producer is choosing the acknowledgement level. So I've maybe already chosen whether I'm going to use a key or not going to use a key, and that's fine. But I need to choose what's going to happen when I send the event into Kafka. Do I care whether it gets there? So there are three options, and the setting you actually set is called ACKS, so A-C-K-S. And you can set it to 0, 1, or all. So if you set it to 0, that means, actually, I just want to keep sending events. Maybe if we lose a few along the way, that's not important. I'm going for very high throughput. It's fire and forget. It is fast, but it is risky. 
the one will basically wait for the broker that you're producing to to come back and say, OK, yeah, I've, re I've received that message. That's fine. Ha I'm happy with that record. So that is a little bit slower, but it, it does at least guarantee that one of the brokers got it. But what it doesn't guarantee is if the broker you've just sent your record to then goes down before replication happens, you might still have lost that message. So it's a little bit safer, but there is still risk involved. So then the final option is all. And that will wait for all of the replicas to happen to the different brokers and for them all to say that they've got the event. So in that case, you can be fairly certain that you're safe. Even if one or more of your brokers goes down, you should still have a copy of that event. And it's interesting to know, a lot of people don't know this, but Kafka will actually send back the acknowledgement when it gets it into memory. It's not when it's written it to disk, because it's relying on the fact that the other brokers have it, that if something goes down, you're using your followers to pick up. So producers can choose their acknowledgement level to say, am I certain that it got there? But of course, if you get back an error, then you have to choose whether to retry. And again, there are some different options. You can say, I don't want to retry at all. If I get back an error, we'll just move on and send the next event. Or you can choose to do retries. Um, initially, in the first versions of Kafka, you would just assume that this could result in having duplicates, because if the broker thought it, if the broker went down and didn't respond, but it ha had actually got the message and it had been replicated, then you might get duplicates. But you can now set up producers to be idempotent so that you don't have any duplicates. So when you're configuring your producer, you need to think about what is it that I'm looking for? Am I looking for more reliable delivery? Am I looking for high throughput and I don't really care what happens to the messages? Do I care about ordering? Because the retry logic and how you do that will make a difference. But you can really set up each individual producer to, of, to Kafka differently depending on its needs. So you can have one Kafka cluster and still have a really configurable way to use it for your different producers. So now let's move on to consumers. So one of the most powerful things about a Kafka consumer is the fact that it can read from any point in your topic and you have multiple consumers reading from the same topic at the same time, from the same point, or from different points. So here we've got consumer A, which is reading from offset 2, and consumer B, which is reading from offset 5. So this is something that you don't generally get from message queuing systems that's specific to event streaming. And of course, we have to keep track of these offsets. So as a consumer is pulling down all of these different events and processing them. If the application were to go down and then come back up, it needs to know where to start from. So the way it does this is it's actually storing its events and sending them off to Kafka to keep them safe. So you can commit in various different ways. You can set up an automatic commit. That's the default that most people start with. We'll basically just commit on a timer. But what that will mean is if you've pulled down some events and you haven't quite finished processing them and your application restarts, you might reprocess the same events if they haven't been committed yet. So again, you have to start asking yourself some questions around what does my consumer really want? What do I care about? Do I want to set up manual asynchronous? processing where I'm a little bit safer, I'm not reprocessing so many messages, but I could still reprocess a message? Or does my application really need to make sure that it's only processing each message once, at which point you should move to manual synchronous? So again, just like producers, your consumers are really configurable and you can set them up individually to work the way you want them. Kafka's actually recently introduced exactly once semantics within uh, producing and consuming. So you can, um, you can say with your consumer that you want to get a message exactly once, whereas previously it would have been at most once or at least once. This is really primarily aimed at stream processing, which I'll come on to in a little bit. Um, but Kafka is sort of moving in this direction where it's looking at having more targeted reliable delivery. But generally, most Kafka applications are more focused on the kind of high throughput, low latency. So we've got these different consumers. But actually, I said that Kafka is set up really easily to be scalable. 
And so we obviously want our consumers to be scalable as well. And we do that using consumer groups. So when you stand up your consumer application, you provide an ID. It's just called a group ID. And basically, every single application that's consuming that connects to Kafka with the same ID will be part of the same group. And then Kafka will help with some routing. So we've got a topic here with three partitions, 0, 1, and 2. And we've got two different consumer groups, A and B. And consumer group A has three consumers, and consumer group B only has two. So what Kafka will do is it will basically set up so that when the consumers connect, they'll split the topic between them. So for the first group, that means that the first consumer will read from partition 0, the second will read from partition 1, and the third will read from part partition 2. So basically, the guarantee is that between all of the consumers in the consumer group, they will see every single record that comes into that topic. But they'll just be reading one partition each. If you have less consumers than you have partitions, then one of your consumers will get more than one partition. So in this case, maybe the top one will read from partition 0, and the bottom one will read from 1 and 2. Kafka doesn't actually look particularly at um, how many events or how high load there is on a particular partition. It will fairly arbitrarily split these up. So now we know in consumer group B that between those two consumers, they'll see all of the events, but perhaps one of the consumers is having to work a little bit harder. But what happens if I add an extra consumer to consumer group A? Well, actually, that will receive no events because the partitions are already split across the different consumers. So that consumer doesn't have anything else to do. And because of the ordering guarantees in Kafka, it doesn't make sense for two consumers that are working together to read the same partition, because then you lose that ordering guarantee. So if you run Kafka yourself, and you stand up three partitions and four consumers, don't be surprised when one of them just sits there doing a heartbeat and doesn't actually receive any events. But if one of my consumers was to go down, then my consumer that's already there could pick up where it left off and carry on. And of course, because the offsets are being stored in Kafka rather than in the app, the new consumer would, know, would know exactly where to start from. So we've talked about the Kafka cluster. We've talked about producers and consumers. But a lot of people, when they look at event streaming, um, initially look and focus on stream processing and very quickly processing the stream of events that's coming in. And Kafka actually has some built, a built-in Java client library to do this. It's called Kafka Streams. It's part of the open source um, Apache Kafka distribution. So when you download Kafka, you um, get access to the jars and things. And it's a client library for processing and analyzing data stored in Kafka. So the key piece here is that all of the processing happens in your application. You're not running a separate processing engine or anything to do that processing. The way it works is you'll have a stream of events coming in. So for example, we've got my input. That's a topic. Within your application, you might do some filtering, some mapping, and then it goes to an output topic. So what does this look like in actual code? So we've got an input topic here with um, the top ones are the keys, and the bottom ones are the values. And this is a little snippet of some um, Java Kafka streams code. So you can see I've created a key stream, builder.stream with my input. So that's the name of my input topic. And then I can say I want to do a filter. So I've got the key value, and I'm going to filter for keys that equal bingo. And then the result of that filter, I will do a map. So for every key value that I get back from the filter, I'm going to change the value to be an uppercase version of that value. And then I'm going to put it back onto my um, output topic. And the result will be these two records. So the two that have bingo will be written out to the output topic with the values uppercased. So you can see it's quite easy because it's a nice library with filter map and there's multiple different options. You can quite quickly build up fairly complex processing of different streams of events and creating new topics and streams of events for other applications to process 
with just very little Java code. So Kafka Streams is um, a library that's actually getting quite a lot of use. A lot of people are moving quickly from doing producing and consuming and wanting to use this instead. And then perhaps they'll just have a consumer app on the end that does something with the outcome of their new streams of events. So as well as the streams processing, Kafka also has another built-in Java library, and that's for doing something called Connect. So this comes back to the use case that I was talking about right at the beginning, which was bridging to cloud-native apps. So lots of people have existing infrastructure. They have existing data. Maybe it's in a database. Maybe it's in a message queuing system. And they might not want to change that existing infrastructure because they're happy with it, but they want to get extra value out of it. They want to get more insight into that data or do more processing on that data that they haven't before. And that's where Kafka Connect comes in. So Kafka Connect is a library for writing applications that pull data from Kafka and put them in an external system or pull them from an external system and put them in Kafka. So you have two different types. They're split into source and sync. So you can see here the source one is pulling from the external and putting into the Kafka cluster, and the sync pulls from Kafka and puts into the external system. And you can come along and write your own connector. You can do, you can see in the middle there, there's this transform. So you can do some transforms as well as the data is flowing through. But the key use case that Kafka Connect is for is if you've got a known system where you just want to stream data from this format into Kafka in a specific format in a fairly known way. So there are lots of different connectors already available. As you can see, things like MySQL up there, IBM MQ. So that's one that actually uh, myself and another colleague worked on, MQTT. And many of these are open source free to use, you can stand them up yourself. So actually, one of the big powers of Kafka Connect is you don't have to write any code at all in order to connect, say, events from MQ into Kafka. All you have to do is provide some properties and configuration to say, this is where my MQ is, this is the topic I want you to use in Kafka, and it will just work. But if you want to write your own Kafka Connect, then you can do that too. So it's a really powerful library to get people connecting Kafka to other existing parts of their infrastructure. So let's have a go at getting started with Kafka. I'm going to exit here. Uh, I think I'm mirrored or not mirrored. Let's mirror the displays. There we go. OK, is that big enough? Can everybody see that at the back? Yes. OK, so uh, this is my Kafka. So I've put in some extra files there. But um, in my bin directory, you can see that I get a lot of shell scripts. So when you download Kafka for the first time, the easiest way to get started is just to use some shell scripts. So I can do zookeeper server start. And I need to provide some properties, but they've already got some properties ready for me by default. So that starts up Zookeeper. I haven't really talked about Zookeeper. You need Zookeeper to store metadata and things like that for Kafka. So then in a new tab, I'm going to start Kafka. Oh, spell it right. And again, we have a handy shell script, server start. Again, we have some handy properties that are already there and ready for us to use. So there's Kafka starting up. And then we also have some shell scripts to look at what topics we have. I think it's called Kafka topics. Yep. I can do a list. I have to provide where my zookeeper is. So by default, it should be on localhost 2181. Uh, and that should list out if I have any topics. So you can see I've got a consumer offsets topic. So that's storing where my consumers have got to. And I've got one called test already. But I'm actually going to create a new one. So I can use the same command line that I can do create. I'm going to call it JSpring. I have to provide the number of partitions that I want. 
because I'm running locally, I'm just going to have one partition and I need to provide my replication factor, which again, it's just going to be one because I'm running locally. So that's now created my topic, JSpring. And if I do a list, I should see it there. There it is. And then to run a producer and consumer, again, there's just some handy, um, I think it starts with Kafka again, console producer. And for the producer, I have to provide a broker.list-list, I think. It's different for the producer and the consumer, so that's something to watch out for. If you just run it, it will tell you what it needs. Really big. Broker dash list, I was right. So I have to provide the broker list, which is where my Kafka is. And by default, it will have started on 9092. I also have to tell it the topic, which was JSpring. So that should connect, yep. I'm not going to put any events on yet. I'm just going to start my consumer as well. So again, handy CLI, Kafka console, consumer. This time, instead of broker list, I provide bootstrap dash servers for some reason. Uh, it's just a different name. This one um, can be a list, I think, but I've only got one running, so 9092. Again, I have to provide the topic, which is JSpring. Um, I can provide... Uh, another setting to say where I want to start, but given that there's nothing on the topic at the moment, it doesn't really matter where I start. So we should just be able to start it like that. Oh, I've set something wrong. Is it not plural? Boots oh, it's singular bootstrap service, so it's not a list. In connect, you can connect to multiple. So I think that's why I forget. Okay, so that's just sitting there now. So if I go back to my producer and I say, hi, is this working? And then I switch back across to my producer. You can see all of the different messages coming through. And then if I kill that, you can see it's processed a total of four messages. So that is the quickest and easiest way to get started with Kafka. I've run Kafka Broker. I've run Zookeeper. I've created a topic. And I've run a producer and consumer straight away. And it all has worked quite nicely. One of the things to be aware of when you first do this is when you're killing everything, you can use, the, they have got scripts for stopping, but if you're just doing control C, stop your Kafka first. Because if you stop Zookeeper first, it gets a bit confused. So definitely st stop Kafka and then stop Zookeeper. But apart from that, it's really easy to use. So if we go back to here. So getting started with Kafka, as you've seen, is really, really quick and easy because when you download Kafka, you just get all of those scripts, all of those properties files. I haven't had to change a single thing. If you were connecting to somebody else's Kafka, you can still use the producer and the consumer scripts. And all you would have to do is you can provide some additional properties to say this is the security or I'm going to provide a different broker list or whatever it is. So getting started is really nice and easy. Um, for writing a Java app, you can use the Java client. So there are clients for Kafka for different languages, for Go, Python. There's quite a lot of different ones. Um, I keep finding new ones. But because Kafka was originally written in Java and Scala, generally in all of the libraries, so things like Streams and Connect, Java is the first language that comes along. And um, for producing and consuming, we already have one. So you just create some properties. You can see some of the things that you can provide here for your producer that I've already talked about. So we've got the bootstrap servers. We've got acts. We've got the timeout that we want the request to do. So the nice thing about both the producer and the consumer API is they are quite clever under the covers. Once you stand it up, when I'm doing this producer.send, this isn't necessarily doing a direct send each, and that's it, one send. There's a lot of error handling and retrying by default that will happen under the covers. So you can make use of this API and you can put your own additional, like you can set everything you might want to for your producer, but a lot of the settings you can leave um, as default. And then you have a similar thing for a consumer. So this is just from the documentation page, so you can just do a while loop and go around. But of course, for the different frameworks and things, they're starting to add libraries that you can use rather than having to write directly 
with this API, but the API is great also. So I've hopefully given you a little bit of an introduction into Kafka and the fact that you have your Kafka cluster and the different brokers, how Kafka by default provides high availability, it provides scaling, it's built to be a good event stream um, system. You have your producers and your consumers, which are highly configurable. So you can configure your cluster, but you can also configure your individual producers and consumers to be specific to different use cases. We have stream processing, which is provided built in as a library. And then we, of course, have Kafka Connect, which has lots of different connectors already built for you that you can use. Or if you want to write your own, then you can. If you have any questions about writing your own, do let me know, because I have done a talk, um, which I think the recording is online somewhere, um, about how to write your own Kafka Connect connector. So the final thing I just wanted to touch on is just uh, what IBM Event Streams is. So that's the product that I work on, and basically that's just a fully supported Apache Kafka with some additional pieces around the edges. So we have our UI to help you integrate with Kafka uh, and sort of manage Kafka, because this particular install that I work on runs on top of Kubernetes, so there's some extra pieces there. Um, and we provide things like geo-replication, so for data recovery, et cetera. But one of the nice things is you can try this for free, and we have a generate a starter application. So if you don't want to use the console or you've done that already, you can generate. It's currently generating a Liberty app, so any of you that were in Adam Bean's talk will have seen Liberty app already today. Um, but you can try that out, and that will generate you a quick app to just send events into um, event streams slash Kafka. So that was all I had today. Thank you very much for listening. If you want more info, you can tweet me here if you have any questions, or I can take questions now as well. Thanks. <laughs>